hello, everybody online and in the future and in person. How are you doing? Good. Did you guys attempt the reading, Modern Moral Philosophy? What did you think? Yeah, it's a hard paper and that's deliberate. Um, I'm trying to mix the reading up. So you get some easy, like cider's a pretty easy one. And then you get some pretty hardcore philosophy to give you a sense of, as you develop, if you continue to take philosophy classes, what the more challenging readings might look like. So today's lecture will address what you attempted to or did get from uh, modern moral philosophy. And then we'll like roll way back and talk about the underpinnings of the debate that uh, Anscom is famously calling stupid and useless. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to begin with just a brief, we're deep enough now into the semester that um, it, I, I thought it might help to sort of bring together the narrative and the concepts of the class. So we started with why philosophy is important important uh, and really good for us to do, right? To live the examined life. So we should be doing philosophy. Um, and, and this I think is important to inspire and motivate the class, but we haven't just been hitting the big questions, right? We haven't just been asking like, am I free? What's good? Is philosophy valuable? Who am I, right? Um, there's a narrative too, right? The way that I've put the readings, hopefully in communication with one another, that this is, this is a story that is beginning to like really come about and be told. So one of the first big questions that we ask ourselves is what we can know of the world and how do we know it, right? Through Descartes, we're um, investigating what we are liable to claim uh, that we know or we're justified in believing, right? Um, but this leads us to a further question, which is what we know of the world and how depends importantly on who we are, right? If I am a thinking thing, what is this I that is supposed to be at the heart and center of my inner discourse, dialogue, my contemplation, my thinking in general, my interaction with the world. But if we are to investigate the eye, we need to investigate what it is that makes us practically, right? Which is to do with our choices. Uh, and that essentially has to do with whether or not we're free. Uh, are we pre-encoded, pre-written, locked into the world beings for whom everything is determined, necessitated, and written? Or are we rather self-determining, uh, libertarian-esque free beings that fly through the world by the seat of our pants and however that feels best to us? Um, what matters for us in free choice may not necessarily be that question, right? So last week, we really ran into the, the praise and blameworthiness as being uh, the important piece in our uh, questions about free will. So whether or not we're hard determinists or libertarians or soft determinists or indeterminists, um, what we're concerned with when we ask ourselves these questions, these like sort of metaphysical quibblings aside is what matters to us, which is how we deal with one another, how we say like, you're to blame or you're to be praised or, uh, you know, that this matters to me because I care about it. Um, and if we're interested in assigning praise and blame, right, over and above the, again, like the metaphysical quibbles of determinism or indeterminism or whatever, we need a kind of ethics, right? So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, and for the rest of the class, we'll be focused more in uh, an ethical and action theory based um, set of philosophical questions. Because uh, I think this is the way that we make philosophy practical. We, we learned why philosophy matters to us, right? Um, to expand the selves, as Russell says. But um, it, I think it's important that we make philosophy not just about theoretical quibbling, but really learning how we can live well in the world. And ethics is where we begin this. Uh, after we have all of our other sort of preamble arguments and questions. Um, so today we're gonna talk primarily about two forms of ethics, consequentialism and deontology. Uh, in just like a nutshell, consequentialism says that actions are good because of their consequences, what's produced on the other end of the action. Uh, whereas the deontologist 
uh, to the contrary says, yeah, like what happens will typically be good, but the way that we really evaluate an action is on the intentions that go into it, right? Is, uh, is the action a good one uh, regardless of whatever the world makes of it? Um, did we think of it well? And does it stand to reason that is practical and ethical reasoning um, that it be good? Uh, and this is the, the, these are sort of like the two um, monster theories uh, of uh, ethical theory, moral evaluation, the, the debates in philosophy and uh, um, other fields up until really Anscombe, right? So uh, you have a, a huge history of consequentialists and, and uh Jeremy Benthamites and Kantians, who we'll talk about later, um, batting against one another. And, and 1950 rolls around, GM Anscombe, being the badass that she is, says, this is all stupid, let's rethink. And this is where we jump into the debate with what we read for today. So Anscombe, um, with this paper, we begin, again, as I just mentioned, in the middle of a centuries long debate. Uh, and Anscombe's big question is, where does the ought get us anyways? Does it really do the important sort of work in this praise and blameworthiness and giving us what matters to us in um, engaging in ethical evaluations? Uh, and she's going to ultimately argue that the typical sense of ought as associated with these moral theories is useless to us or not as useful as uh, the codgy old English philosophers Sidgwick and Hare and his friends seem to think. Uh, so Anscombe calls the debate stupid and goes, gives good reason to think that modern moral philosophy is a waste of time. Uh, and the problem is that both rely upon unsupportable foundations. So what she's ultimately gonna say is, is look, uh, the, the moral philosophies that are out there, uh, your consequentialisms and your uh, deontologies and all of their different slight iterations from one another rely upon uh, judgments of what justifies our claims of good as being actually good, right? Uh, and these judgments uh, would only be incontrovertible and not a kind of capriciousness or um, uh, fad based if uh, there were not also some sort of you know divine God power, whatever that uh, would make it true in every case, this omniscient being who could know that no matter what would happen, the, the, there would be a certain set of actions that are good. Now, we're humans, we're finite, we're imperfect. Uh, so the best we can do is reason to what these principles might be. Uh, Anscombe argues that any reason to principle is gonna be unsatisfactory uh, based on fads of what we think is good at the time, which changes from generation to generation and makes a big mess of ethics. So we need to stop worrying about this debate and look to something new, which we'll talk about at the very end of lecture. Um, so who is Anscombe? Probably like the most badass philosopher in the 20th century. Um, she was a student of Wittgenstein, uh, who's also maybe one of the most badass philosophers in 20th century. Um, she was the chair of the Department of Philosophy at Cambridge uh, for a bunch of years until she retired. A uh, hugely uh, influential and controversial figure. Um, as Catholic as they come, and this is some of the controversy as she has some um, peculiar Catholicism based arguments, it, primarily around like contraception is where the um, conflict and controversy comes in. But uh, she has this really strong religious uh, inspiration sort of at the heart of her work. However, um, this religious inspiration is sort of, at, at least in modern moral philosophy and in some of her other really important work like intention, um, sort of uh, under the covers, right? So we'll look at that. Um, she inspires some of the most influential debates on action, intention, moral philosophy. Um, and is specifically responsible for the revival of virtue ethics, which is the coolest form of ethics. And we'll talk about it next week after we read Aristotle. So what's going on in modern moral philosophy? Um, there's a form of argument. And again, because this was a challenging paper, what I wanna do is frame what's going on in the paper, what her argument is or what it might be uh, before we roll back even further to what the heck she's talking about at all. So, um, 
there are two logical principles that we should all know. Uh, if you take an intro to logic class, you'll learn these. Um, these are like some of our most basic forms of inference. You use them all the time, uh, but you may not know them by their strange, funky Latin names. I have a friend whose cat is named Modus Ponens. Um, so Modus Ponens says if P then Q and P therefore Q, right? So if it's raining, P, then the ground is wet, Q, and it's raining. So what can we infer? Yeah, great. So modus ponens, very simple, right? Um, modus tollens is the inverse, right? So uh, if it's raining, then the ground is wet. Well, the ground isn't wet. So what can we infer? Yeah, exactly. Because if the, what this logical construction says is that the, the fact of rain necessitates the ground being wet. And so if the ground's not wet, then it's impossible that it be raining because it couldn't rain without making the ground wet, right? So there's a controversy in the literature concerning modern moral philosophy, which I think is really interesting um, that I'll flag here. Uh, and then we won't really talk much about, but it is interesting at least to know um, that uh, you can interpret Anscombe's argument in modern moral philosophy as a modus ponens, right? Or as a modus tollens, and you get different like conclusions. Right? So the modus ponens version of the argument is that if religious-based ethics is wrong, then virtue ethics is the best way to go. Uh, so the idea here is, look, consequentialism and deontology both require either um, this God to justify what counts as good, uh, but all of the contemporary modern English philosophers, these kaji old dudes sitting in their armchairs by, by the fire and talking about utility calculuses and stuff, um, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, all deny the existence of this God. And so their form of ethics is insufficient. Uh, therefore, modus ponens, virtue ethics is the best way to go. But there's an alternative reading of her argument in modern moral philosophy, which is the modus tollens version. If religious-based ethics is wrong, right? Like if there's no God to ground the, the justification of our normative claims, our moral claims about what counts as good, good and bad, um, then again, virtue ethics is the way to go. But it's not the case that virtue ethics is the best way to go. This, this is the controversial alternative interpretation. And what you get from this is a, a modus tollens uh, conclusion that it's not the case that religious-based ethics are wrong. And both of these readings are completely consistent with what's present in modern moral philosophy. They're also both completely consistent with Anscombe's uh, life's philosophy, right? Uh, and I think the debate is fascinating. I wonder if um, uh, Anscombe intended to be sort of subversive and allow the interpretation to go both ways because she was wildly Catholic, deeply, amazingly Catholic. Uh, but she also seems to champion uh, virtue-based thinking uh, as the best kind of thinking when we are engaging in you know, ethical theory uh, as is important for our everyday lived lives, uh, not the lives of Cambridge philosophers sitting in their armchairs by the fire, right? Um, so for the purpose of the class, uh, I'll just assume the modus ponens interpretation, but just so that's out there, um, she was you know, brilliant. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, snickering to herself as she was writing um, her polemic argument here that this was on her mind. I could also justify my own theistic intuitions. Anyways, so um, we're eventually going to get to the point where we have argued that virtue ethics is the best way to go. Uh, but first, we need to show the insufficiency of both uh, utilitarianism or consequentialism and deontology. So let's look at those. Uh, and in the spirit of Halloween, uh, this is Jeremy Bentham's uh, disembodied head. This is his actual head. That's it's a, it's a real human's head that has been preserved. And it was on display uh, until, I, I don't know, do, do you know this, Steve, like 1970 something? There were some like frat guys that stole the head as a prank. Um, and uh, they uh, eventually returned it. But since then, it's been under lock and key and they replaced it with the wax uh, version. I think the body is still Bentham's body. But, you know, it's pretty spooky, right? He wanted it to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he asked. wanted this to happen to his body. Not the head being stolen. <laughs> Right, yeah, so, and, and they did it, right? So you, 
it, if you want to be preserved forever and look like this in 150 years, start talking about consequences of ethical actions and fecundity or fecundicity calculuses and stuff. Spooky. He's a weird guy. Philosophers are strange people. Um, so utilitarianism is a form of consequentialism. Consequentialism is sort of like your broad umbrella term for the view of ethics that says that moral evaluation is based on what happens in the world, but the consequences of actions. Utilitarianism is just one way of realizing and measuring uh, this. And it's uh, founded by Jeremy Bentham and his uh, uh, student, I think it was his student, uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, the utilitarians for as much crap as I'm about to give them and that we're gonna see is troubling in their um, views on ethics and that still like plagues all sorts of um, uh, departments. So like e economics departments, um, statistics departments all rely on utilitarian calculuses to determine like what rational agents are and stuff. It's a big mess. Um, and for all of the big mess, they were pretty fantastic people. They agitated for social reforms. They were using utilitarianism to like do good stuff in their um, kaji old English world. Uh, they advocated for women's rights and the abolition of debtors prison, um, abolition of slavery, the establishment of public schools, prison reform, legal reform, public health initiatives. These guys were like the Bernie Sanders of their day and pretty effective ones too, right? Not just sort of locked away in a bipartisan Congress that, you know, couldn't, yeah, exactly. Um, these guys did good stuff for as spooky as their um, views turn out to be. Um, and the underlying sort of intuition behind utilitarianism uh, is hedonism. So hedonism as Bentham states is just that nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do as well as to determine what we shall do. So this is, uh, this is a metaphysical thesis. He's, he's saying what it is to be a human, what human nature consists in. Human nature consists in these two uh, inspired needs, uh, the need for pleasure and the need to escape pain. And this is at the heart of everything that we do, want, why we act, uh, all of the sort of precursor questions that I talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Um, so it's, it's on his Tinder profile, apparently. Um, there's two forms of hedonism, two ways of thinking about what the hedonic principle might mean to us. There's psychological hedonism, uh, which is that humans are always motivated to avoid pain and pursue pleasure, that it's hardwired, hard encoded into our brains. Uh, and then there's also normative hedonism, which your Burning Man friends might sort of impose upon you if you ever get them talking about Burning Man, is that humans ought to pursue uh, pleasure and to avoid pain, right? That there's something good, just like intrinsically, not even extrinsic, not like extrinsic good being like getting money for doing a task. The money is an extrinsic good. An intrinsic good is something that's good for the sake of itself that like in doing it, you get paid. Um, so the, the normative hedonist would say that there's something intrinsic about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain that's, that's good. And for John Stuart Mill, it could go either way. Pleasure and freedom from pain are the only things desirable as ends and that all desirable things are desirable either for the pleasure inherent in themselves or as a means to the promotion of pleasure, the prevention of pain. Um, and we measure this acquisition of pleasure and prevention of pain by what's called utility, thus utilitarianism. So utility is the tendency of an object whereby it tends to produce benefit, advantage, pleasure, good, or happiness, or to prevent the happening of mischief, pain, evil, or unhappiness. So utility is just the measure of uh, degree to which pleasure is achieved or pain is avoided. Um, and so we have a principle of utility then that stands at sort of the heart of this form of consequentialism, which is that you do whatever maximizes utility. You do what, what, whatever is the best thing to do is that action which gives you the most pleasure and the least amount of pain, right? So let's think through an example. Is anybody familiar with this? Yeah, we're all internet culture people. So this is called the trolley problem for the uninitiated. Um, the trolley problem, uh, if you've seen The Good Place, they do it like for real, it's fantastic. 
um, you know, The Good Place is an interesting show. Like I, I study philosophy, right? So all of my family's like, you gotta watch The Good Place. Right? And so I put it off forever because, you know, rebellious spirit when your parents tell you to do something you say no screw you um but you know eventually i watch it and, and they, they treat the trolley problem really well because the trolley actually hits the, the person <laughs> so you see um chidi like scream with dismay as he watches blood and guts fly all over the place it's fantastic anyways again another reason not to give philosophers nih grants so the way the trolley problem works is uh there you are with the lever, right? Um, and there is a trolley on a track that is headed towards four people who are tied up on the track. If you do not pull the lever, nothing will happen. The trolley will barrel over the four people, killing all of them and causing some sort of untold gore and chaos. However, you can pull the lever and the track will shift, right? And the trolley will no longer hit four people and instead hit the one unfortunate soul who you've condemned to death. Who pulls the lever? Who doesn't pull the lever? <laughs> Fast enough to uh, kill. Yeah, so assume the trolley is unmanned. Yeah. Steve, you didn't vote. It's cheating. What, what are we, what are we on? Do you, do you pull the lever? Does anybody not pull the lever? That's a great question. <laughs> Again, don't give philosophers NIH grants. Does, how about online? Does anybody not pull the lever? Let me get a look at you all. No, you're all lever pullers. Wow, I'm the only one. Yeah, I, I don't pull, but I, I'm a freak. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Interesting. That that's. Yeah. I, I suppose that. Uh, so, it. At least with respect to uh, probabilities, as have been measured, um, that's pretty typical it's one in ten that doesn't pull lever yeah going back to like free will last week are you is the reason why you don't pull lever is because maybe those four people who are right tied up were already condemned to pass anyways and by changing that that's one of the three nights that that means the person who did the job as well which is like that it's exactly right yeah so um there, there's an addition of this plus like the context stuff which i try to forget because the thought experiment you know like just says well, you don't know any other details um, but the, so I grew up Catholic, um, and there's, I, I talked about this last week too, difference between sin by omission and sin by commission. Uh, and it seems to me that it's an impossible choice, no matter what you do. Uh, so I'd rather sin by omission and just, you know, feel the shame of not having done than of actually, you know, made an action that determined, I, I don't know, it, it's all like personal feeling, which might be selfish. It may be principled. I'm not sure that there is a right answer. In fact, there's not supposed to be. It's just supposed to pump your intuitions um, and then make you feel awful for having the intuitions that you do. Um, so interesting that I'm the only one. Uh, this is not the right answer. If this was what you were thinking because you are a sick monster, this is not the right answer. The, the Multi-track drifting is not the way to go. Um, most people do do uh, the, the pull the lever, um, but let's change the case. You all said you're gonna pull the lever, but what if the four people on the track are really awful? Not, not like your generally conscript, cons conscripted German 20 year old who has grown up in 1940, but like the actual like Himmler Nazi guys, right? Like Himmler and, and Hitler and uh, I don't know, two, concentration camp officers are on the tracks. And then, uh, I don't know, who's a really good person? Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. Mother Teresa is a questionable one. You know, just ex altruistic person on the tracks. Who pulls the lever? 
Yeah, screw those Nazis, right? Yeah, we all change our minds. Does anybody pull the lever online? Does anybody continue to pull the lever? No. Oh, maybe. You waver. Why are you wavering? Well, from an engineering standpoint, I'm more looking at the track now. Uh, That's a really sharp turn. Maybe the trolley will like flip off and everyone is saved. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> it, we should we should really care about infrastructure. If capitalism teaches us anything, wow. it's that industry <laughs> must go on. And if we're pulling levers left and right, who knows what's going to happen to these tracks? That's certainly the right answer. <laughs> okay. Oh, darn it. Okay. Let's change the case again. Uh, for normal people, they're no longer awful Nazis on the track. There's only one track, but there's a bridge. And uh, hanging over the bridge is a fat guy. Very fat guy. Fat enough that uh, this person's weight would, if pushed, stop the trolley in its tracks and no longer hit the four people. Yeah. Who pushes the fat guy? Wow. Would it kill the fat guy though? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're pushing, you're no longer pulling a lever. This is how the, the case changes, right? It's no longer an impersonal like switch that you're pulling. You're pushing a human being, a overweight human being over the rails of a bridge to their imminent doom, their sudden and awful death to save poor people. And it looks like, the, so raise your hands one more time. It looked like it was 50 50. And then let me look online too. Who, who online is, is pushing the, the guy? Okay, and then just so you can see in class. Okay, it looks like most people online don't. Also interesting datum, uh, which might also be consistent with some of the experiments that have been done on this. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The memes for this lecture are going to be dank all the way through. So there's an interesting branch of philosophy called X5 experimental philosophy. It's the really edgy dorky name that they call themselves. We go, Yo, we do X5. Um, where basically the idea is that you are doing experimental philosophy insofar as you construct experiments that pump intuition so that you can judge what people's general moral intuitions consistent. So sort of like the experiment that we just did where we're raising our hands, right? Um, we can do with a general population and then see how the general population's intuitions change given certain conditions or just are uh, naturally. So um, this is called trolley psychology. 90% of people in the original case choose to hit the lever, right? One in 10, doesn't. Uh, if the person is a romantic partner, they're much less likely to push. So in the fat guy case, like it's, a, it's like your, your romantic, your wife, your husband or whoever, right? And the question is, do you push the person that you love in order to save these four anonymous people? Uh, you're much less likely to do it, right? Um, men are more likely than women to say it's okay to push the, the person, right? Um, which didn't seem to be the case with, with us. Women were in this class or group. Um, so uh, people who watch a comedy clip before running the experiment are also more likely to uh, push, right? So if you interpret the case as comical, then yeah, <laughs> right? But if it's given to you outright, you're less likely. Uh, People are more likely to sacrifice men than women. So if it's no longer a fat guy, but a fat woman or just a woman in general, you're less likely to push, right? Um, so, so these are like interesting, just facts about moral intuitions in a general population. The way that these are typically collected, just to give you some of the experimental background is through MTurk, um, which is Amazon's platform for like survey taking. And, and MTurk is generally pretty good um, like overall population predictor, right? It, it's not terribly biased and it has little bits of bias here and there, but um, it's generally pretty okay. So these are like kind of robust, interesting experimental 
results. Um, okay, so back to principle of utility. We've done some cases. Um, why do we choose to pull the lever in the original case? Well, you know, one person is better than four. If people are gonna die, then better less people die. And why is this? Well, because we're satisfying the principle of utility being maximize pleasure and minimize pain. There's a huge, there's three times, four times more um, pain in the death of the four people than the death of the one. And so we just perform the calculus done, right? We do whatever maximizes our total utility. And this principle of utility, um, if we are to break it down, comes with two steps. There's aggregation and there's maximization. So aggregation is just performing the calculus, looking at, okay, uh, option one, option two, option three, it's worth this much, it's worth that much, it's worth this much utility, and then measuring them against one another, and then maximization is just picking the one that gives you the most pleasure or the least pain, right? Um, and it's in this way that we get not just an ethical principle, but also one of social justice, right? Um, abolition of uh, slavery and debtor's prison is all based on principle of utility, that we want to maximize pleasure, minimize pain. And these are things that only serve to hurt people. And what pleasure they do bring is minimal compared to the, the goodness that would come about, right? Uh, instituting public schools and giving women the right to vote, to enfranchise. Um, these are all sort of the, the real practical ends of the utilitarians who are uh, writing in, in the, the time of Bentham and Mill. So if you are interested in ethics and you think that the world is run by mathematics, and this is the theory for you, because that's the actual real equation. Um, so in applying the principle of utility, here's what you do. You, one, calculate the total amount of pleasure and pain that's likely to result from an action. Two, uh, then calculate the total amount of pain that is or will likely result from the action. You subtract the pain from the pleasure. And hey, presto, you've got the utility of a particular action. Um, now what you do is you calculate the utilities of all of your relevant options, and then you choose the action that has the highest utility. How do you give a number to the pain pleasure concept? This way. So um, you have to, okay, so great question. Uh, and this is, again, going to be sort of the, at the heart of the issue that uh, Anscombe has with specifically uh, consequentialism is that assigning numeric value to pain pleasure is really strange. And, and one easy way of doing it is with money, right? So you could say, uh, if I work for this job, then, so say I work at uh, an Amazon fulfillment center, I will have infinite pain, but I'll make 15, 20 bucks an hour. Um, <laughs> Or if I work as a philosophy graduate student, I'll have infinite pleasure, but make, you know, like, wow. yes. <laughs> uh, so how do we measure these against one another? Um, and money is one way of doing it, but how do I compare the like pleasure of a life of passion versus the minimal amount of money that comes from it? It's a big mess, right? So comparing existential, uh, or, or quantifying the existential human condition in terms of pain and pleasure, and then calling them units or utils, right? It seems absurd and ridiculous and absolutely strange. And there might be some God out there who says, oh yeah, this action is one util, this action is two. So the, the good place, right? They do this, you get scores. And this is like the whole premise of the show is that the scoring system is goofed up. Um, but in principle, it seems a little ugly to me to do any kind of quantification of that sort. Um, yeah. You kind of answered the question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but imagining that you could um, measure, even if you didn't get a precise quantification, it seems to me that you could say, uh, is it like abolition of slavery, for instance. Uh, how many slaves are in the United States circa 1850? Uh, how many slave owners? How much? Uh, uh, happiness to the slave owners get from persisting in their way of life versus how much pain is uh, uh, created by the conditions of slavery uh, in the United States. And it seems to me that there's a massive more amount of pain than pleasure. And that is pretty prima facie true, right? Um, that, that it would be... Uh, absurd 
you know, like approaching absurdity at like to be as charitable as I possibly can to argue to the contrary. So even if you can't give a precise quantification of like value, um, that we still have cases like that where you can say, yeah, well, of course the like Southern way of life is makes them happy, but is it really more than the amount of pain that and horror and suffering that's caused? Well, no, of course not. And so there you have a kind of measurement. But in everyday actions, like, should I do the reading for class today? Or uh, should I speed because I'm late, right? These sorts of things that like every day, who knows? Uh, parking is one that I do do, just to give you another example. Um, so if a parking ticket is 50 bucks and they only told a lot, like one out of five days, and it would cost me 10 bucks a day to park, then why waste the time paying for parking, right? But that's a money one. So step two is just to maximize, right? So after we've done this calculus, we've somehow quantified pleasure and pain. Uh, we have a bunch of different actions in front of us, possible courses of action. Do I pay for parking? Do I not? Uh, and then you choose the one that gives you the most utility, right? So some objections. One is that atrocities become permissible. Anything is permissible so long as it brings about the best consequences overall, right? Like in the grand scheme of things, maybe a little genocide here and there is all right, because everybody will end up being happy at the other end of things, right? So you get torture, bombing of civilians, putting innocent people in jail, Maoist execution of res uh, resistors, and famously Nagasaki and Hiroshima. World War II persists. Many more people probably would have died if the war had gone on. Uh, and so Truman uses a similar kind of calculus to justify his drop in the bombs on civilian populations in like the just, and not even these, but like the fire bombings and stuff too. Anyways, Truman says himself, it was a terrible decision, but I made it. And I made it to save 250,000 boys from the United States. And I'd make it again under similar circumstances. Seems to have conviction that um, he's doing the right thing for his people and maximizing utility for those 250,000 United States boys. And maybe it is the choice that produces the most utility overall, but damn, that's a lot of like nuclear melted people, civilians, like non-combatants. Um, pretty evil, awful thing. Unforgivable, really. Um, but that's the, the calculation that, that goes on in, in a wartime leader's head. Um, and I, I'm not a Photoshop master, but I was really proud of this one. I found the perfect photo of Thanos to mix with the Infinity Gauntlet. So Thanos is probably utilitarian too, right? It's snapping away half the population to have more food for people or something. I, I didn't watch those movies, so I don't really know. Um, there's not enough protection for individual rights. Uh, and you get this, like, it's for the greater good, it's for the greatest good that we choose to do this. And for the greater good seems to be a pretty awful slogan in like all of our dystopia movies. Like you've read 1984, we've seen V for Vendetta. That's kind of like the motto of all of these dystopian governments that are you know, fascist controlling of everybody's lives. And you sacrifice your freedom for the greater good. Um, it's kind of a mess. So in response to this, we get kind of this distinction between what's called act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism, which is supposed to give you a more nuanced kind of uh, utilitarian calculus. So act utilitarianism is the kind that we've been talking about uh, where each action in isolation should just produce the highest amount of utility, perform the calculus, and there you go, right? Best actions uh, are context sensitive. Um, you just, whatever the calculus says is what you do. Now, there's also rule utilitarianism, which doesn't say that we need to produce the most utility in each of our discrete actions, but rather uh, we need to establish rules that govern how we act, and it's the rules that we measure the utility calculus on. So for a rule utilitarian, you say something like, if all the evidence points to the fact of a murder, then the death penalty is justified, right? Uh, because when all of the evidence points to the fact of a murder, in most cases, then the person murdered the other person, and uh, you have some other alternative argument about why like retributive justice is valuable or something, which it isn't. 
Um, but it, this is sort of like the idea of this sort of rule-based calculus. So we set the rule and you say the rule is what produces the most utility on the whole in general, right? Um, but here we have Anscom popping in. But if someone really thinks in advance that it's open to question whether such an action is pr procuring the judicial execution of the innocent should be quite excluded from consideration. I do not want to argue with him. He shows a corrupt mind. This is a polemic argument. It's sort of ad hominem attack. It's attacking the person rather than addressing the, the issue. But we sort of should feel the indignation that, that Anscombe is uh, inscribing here, which is that, look, if you're a real utilitarian and you calculate what is good and what is bad on the basis of this utility calculus such that it could in some cases justify the execution of an innocent person because it satisfies the rule like oops the the rule messed up but usually it's pretty good and that's what matters then that sort of person is just corrupt right they're not the sort of person that really cares about what matters to us in morality and in ethics they're not really concerned with the the good well-being the the better living of people they're concerned with their cogiold mathematical formulations of uh, ethics in one way or another. There's another objection. And for everybody here who wants to check it out later, this, this is a link. And I think there's a link to the next objection too. Fun little like three minute videos that'll sort of cover this. True for everybody online too. So if you're watching this on YouTube in the future, click the link in the PowerPoint slide. It's on um, Canvas uh, if you're following along. But the utility monster. So imagine that there is a monster that gets more pleasure from resources than all humans put together. So uh, if you give this monster a bowl of rice, it will be happier than if you gave every single person in the world a bowl of rice. And imagine that they're all hungry people, so they'll get satisfied, right? That this monster is a freak and just like loves everything so much, right? So a utilitarian, insofar as they're trying to maximize utility, uh, would be justified in giving all resources of the Earth's economy and infrastructure to this utility monster. Just feed everything to this monster, right? Let it be all consuming because it is all utility producing. Hurrah, we've produced the best world that we possibly can. Um, that seems absurd, right? But what if we change the utility monster to something more real life? something like a handicapped person or a person in a coma, right? Then it seems a little less absurd that the person in the coma uh, costs for the family like tens of thousands of dollars and assume in, the, in this case that like they, they never wake up, um, that those tens of thousands of dollars could have paid for someone's college education. Uh, it could have uh, covered the, the rent for years. It, it could have been the down payment for the, the car that they needed so that they could stop taking the, right, this sort of thing, right? So what if a utility monster becomes something more real? Then it seems a little less absurd. What do you think? Do we have thoughts on this case? Is this a true objection to utilitarianism, right? It, should we think of the utility monster as problematic or maybe not? Personally, I just know it's, that's a hard situation because, like, you don't always know if they're going to wake up. But, like, personally, my mom always said if she didn't want to go to the world, um, but like, it just depends on the person and the situation that that person's in, I think. And that, that's the whole issue with utility. It's not every situation the same. Right. So, this is good. Um, the, the comment here, as I, as I heard it, is that every person's utility calculus is gonna sort of be their own and trying to generalize based on rules uh, or concepts of human nature or like human psychology um, is to whitewash the fact that we all live individual, unique, independent lives and different things matter to us. And that it's way too complex to ultimately say which set of uh, human needs, desires, uh, cognitive, uh, adaptations, maladaptations are the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, and this is very much in spirit with, with Anscombe's objection. Um, and why we need to think more individually about um, what matters to us in 
considering ethics and that if you are utilitarian, you are too principled. It's, it's like one thought too many to try to calculate all of this good and bad stuff. So another fun example, the experience machine. So imagine that there's a machine uh, in which you'll be hooked up and you will experience all the pleasurable things that you love and never experience pain. Uh, so in like TV shows and um, video games, I think there's a Twilight Zone episode where this sort of, sort of thing happens. A, a guy like goes in this machine and you don't know he's in there until the end spoiler. Um, but he, he gets like teleported to this happy go lucky 1950s white picket fence town you know like, like david lynch before everything goes totally nutso and crazy kind of neighborhood right everybody's just so happy and there's pies on the windowsills of people's houses steaming and ready to be eaten um, and kids are playing in the street returning from school etc this sort of thing right so the experience machine says uh you will snap into one of these whatever it is to you, fantasy worlds in which there is no pain, there is only pleasure. Uh, and whatever that means to you is what will be produced um, internally in your head in the experience machine. However, in uh, reality, you're just sitting, wasting away uh, in a tube or something matrix style um, being used for uh, the, the food and fuel of the machine overlords that have conquered the world that Matrix, right? This might be helpful with this, but like with this machine, what is pleasure if you don't experience pain? You know? uh, yeah, so so you might say that there's a conceptual problem with the thought experiment that there is no such thing as pleasure without pain, um, and there's some interesting work in the philosophy of pain on on this. So you might think that um, some people enjoy pain. So for instance, I. Uh, for lunch today, put a bunch of jalapenos on my um, burrito and enjoyed it. I love the like heat and the the like just sort of submissive power it has over me, where you just have to like be in it. Um, it there's there's a pleasure in that, though it hurts. Right? Um, other people feel differently about spice, um, and so you might interpret certain forms of pain as pleasure. You might also think that. Um, as this might be like the intuition and in, in what you're saying, because it's sort of how you constructed it. There might be like a soul making kind of idea here, which we'll talk about soul making in a few weeks when we do proofs or God. Um, but the soul making idea is that there can be no good without the overcoming of evil. So uh, something about pleasure might be in overcoming pain or uh, that for every pleasurable action, there's some equal and opposite amount of pain that's been avoided or uh, whatever. So conceptually, the experience machine might have an issue, might also say that the pain is somehow physically represented, whereas the pleasure is internally represented. Um, but the idea here is that utilitarian says, heck yeah, let's get in this experience machine. Let my body rot so that my mind can you know, live in its joyful fantasy land, right? Um, I'm curious, who, who would get in this machine? Okay, we have a couple hedonists. How about online? Does anybody get in the machine? online are we already in the machine because we're all in little zoom windows so this our virtual experience machine and why is it an, it an intro to philosophy class go do something cooler nobody online goes in the oh that looked like there was a nod kind of like experience machines okay yeah i i don't know what to think about this case uh i like the idea of it but my moral intuitions or in complete conflict. So I think that would default me out of the machine, but that might be a fearful response, um, personally. I don't really know what to say about myself, but I respect those of you who are like, yeah, of course, <laughs> heck yeah. Um, okay, so Kantian ethics. We've been talking about consequentialism, the, the measure of goodness, moral evaluation on the basis of what is produced on the other end of actions. Now uh, we'll look at deontology, which is sort of looking at the, the inspiration where action comes from, the, the reasoned basis for which we would act in one way or another as being uh, the criteria for what counts as good and bad. So Kant's big questions, uh, what moral obligations do we human beings have? 
Uh, and where do these obligations come from? Like, what, what is it that we ought to do? And why is it that we ought to do these things? Where, where do these oughts come from at all? And how do we know that they even are real, normatively, like, like inspirational forces that guide us? So uh, to answer the fundamental questions of ethics, according to Kant, we should use pure rational reflection. So here's Homer thinking what is probably the stupidest joke I've come up with in my adult life. Um, or in other words, we should reflect on our concepts and what they mean in order to determine what counts as good and what counts as bad. That, uh, and you know, like per the rest of Kant's philosophical system, uh, it's in your head. So in other words, we can use our minds to determine what is objectively morally good or bad, or that is what it is our duty to do, how to perform. Uh, so as Kant says, we must follow and present distinctly the practical faculty of reason from its general rules of determination to the point where the concept of duty arises from it. So this is him sort of inspiring himself uh, and his reader to engage in the practice of uh, thinking through what uh, it must be to have a duty to act in one way and not in another. And this concept of moral duty includes two ideas. One is absoluteness, uh, where moral duties must be obeyed and there are no exceptions, and two, universality. Moral duties apply to everyone. And these we might see as either uh, drawbacks or uh, uh, like pros or cons over the consequentialist uh, system of ethics. So the, for the consequentialist, whatever is good or bad is context relative, that you do the utility calculus and whatever it says uh, is what you do. And sometimes it might be okay to uh, pull the plug and sometimes it might not be, right? The, the, the calculus changes based on context. But for a rule of, uh, of moral evaluation, what counts as good or bad, we might want something more strict. We might want something that says, there just are good actions and there are bad actions. There's an absoluteness to what we call good or bad, capital G, capital B. And this is sort of what Kant is, is after. He doesn't wanna say that, oh, well, it's sort of up to you, man, what counts as good or bad. Um, he wants to say, no, that there are actually good things and actually bad things. Um, and then we also get universality, which is that these good and bad things, insofar as they're absolute, apply to everybody across the board, that we all must adhere to them. It is our duty to. And if you don't adhere to the absolutely good uh, and avoid the absolutely bad, then you are acting poorly. You're being a bad person. You're not acting in accordance with your duty. Um, so the method will yield more reliable knowledge, universal truths rather than particular truths, right? So we get... Um, uh, these maxims, as he calls them, which we'll talk about. So don't do this or do this, right? Uh, uh, thou ought not commit adultery, right? That's like the sixth of the 10 commandments or something. Um, this is a universal and absolute rule. It's like God said it, don't do it. Um, there are no cases in which adultery is good according to this absolute universal rule. Um, there's no context sensitive state in which it would be okay to commit adultery. Um, so uh, it's universal. It's uh, the, the sort of thing that we might want in, in our moral system. Now, we also get our answers that will be um, better from a practical perspective is they'll have greater motivational power, as Kant says. From the pure thought of duty in general of the moral law mixed with no foreign addition of empirical inducements has by way of reason alone an influence on the human heart so much more powerful than all other incentives. Now, this is Kant psycholog psychologizing, and Kant was a weirdo loner, um, and so he's probably wrong about this, but he seems to really think that duty is very motivational. It's very inspirational. It's the thing that we want more than anything. Uh, so where Bentham says, yeah, what is, or was it John Stuart Mill quote, what's at the, the heart of everything that we want is to feel good and not feel bad. Kant says at the heart of everything that we want is to do our duty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and three, Kant's strategy could vindicate the claim that moral obligations apply universally. So it is of greatest practical importance not to make its principle, the principle of morality, dependent upon the special nature of human reason, but instead just because moral laws are supposed to hold for every rational being as such to derive them from the universal concept of a rational being as such. What he's saying here in his weird 
circular way of writing is that there is a, a way that it is to be a rational being. We all have a rational capacity. This rational capacity being shared by all of us uh, should allow us all individually to derive a unique principle of duty, of what it is to be morally good. Uh, and because each of us are able to do this individually, because we're all rational beings, um, then we can say that not only is it capable for us to derive this notion of duty, but the notion of duty applies universally. It uh, rules all of our lives. So some key concepts, and this is the, the idea of will, how we decide or how we wish to do, the idea of practical reasoning or faculty of reasoning as it applies to not just thinking, but uh, motivating action, and then categorical imperatives. So the will is just the thing that the power in us, like a rational capacity to think and reason. The will is the, the power in us to cause actions, right? And we each have a will. We each have the capacity to cause actions. Uh, how we use this will is uh, the, the directive of our practical reasoning. So practical reasoning is the use of reasoning or set of cognitive abilities to evaluate our reasons for action and our options for a given situation. So practical reasoning for utilitarian is to perform this calculus. For Kant, it's to uh, sit down and think really hard about what good is and then infer that everyone must think this and then apply that rule uh, to everybody. So how or should I do my reading for the class? Um, we think about what is important about reading and um, whether or not uh, it's a, in general a good principle to do reading for class and you know, this sort of thing. We reason ourselves to a, a notion of good. Uh, and if we were perfect beings, if we were omniscient, omnipotent, uh, whether or not we we're omnibenevolent, I suppose is sort of beyond the, the scope here. But um, if we are at least all knowing and all powerful, uh, we would be able to do this really well. We'd be able to think through all of the, uh, the alternatives. We'd be able to think through all of the world and uh, come up with some derivation of a principle of goodness. As Kant says, the will only has the capacity to choose uh, that, which is, that which reason cognizes as practically necessary, that as good. And a perfect being could do this, but we're not perfect beings. We can reason pretty well, uh, but we can't reason all the way through to the, the bottom of everything. The will is not always determined by reason. We don't always do what we believe to be the right thing. This is called acrasia, the weakness of will. Um, it's not a problem that we'll deal with in this class. I don't think it's in my virtue ethics lecture, but it's an interesting one. So like texting and driving, for instance, is a, a, a kind of acrasia uh, where you know that you should pay attention to the road. It's, you should always be paying attention to the road while you drive. If you don't, you're doing something wrong. Um, please pay attention to the road while you drive. Uh, but then you text anyways, right? So you have this like sort of major principle and then a minor action that obstructs the principle. So um, as Descartes would say, our will outstrips our intellect, that the will is able to do more than we determine as good or bad through intellect. So we're imperfect beings. When we act morally, we subject our will or our capacity to act on the basis of reasons to the demands of reason. Um, I have a will that guides me to do one thing or another. I practically reason, I think about why or what I should do. Um, and when we act morally, I'm subjecting my will to what I've determined is good or bad. And as Kant would say, when we obey the laws or principles or imperatives of reason, we do good. So as long as our action is consistent with what we've reasoned to be good, then we are doing good. And he gives us a sort of analog to the utility calculus, but as like a rational sort of exercise, a hypothetical um, to coming up with these principles of what would count as good or bad. So we have a good will. As long as you act well, you have a good will. But what are the imperatives of reason? What does reason tell us when we think about it is good or bad, right? Um, so principles that represent an action as objectively necessary in itself without reference to uh, another end is a categorical imperative. So a categorical imperative is the sort of thing that you reason to that tells you that you sh this is your duty, that you should do this, it's absolute, it's universal, it applies to everybody, um, and it is uh, objectively necessary and always good. Um, the action is represented as good in itself by reason. Um, and the form of one of these is do X, do read for class. Right. 
the categorical imperative is the right kind of imperative if we're looking for a moral law because it tells us how to act and it's accessible to rational thinking. And whatever your aims or desires, you will have a reason to do what is good in itself because it's reasonable, because it's universal, it's available to everyone. It's our duty, it's the moral law. So you might want to respond to you know, your boyfriend's text while you're driving, but you don't because you know that you ought not to text while you drive because your proclivity for being in an accident is way higher and you don't want to get in an accident, you know, and kill yourself or anybody else or cause serious injury, that sort of thing, right? Stands to reason. So you don't do it. You subvert your desire for the sake of what is rationally good and thus you exercise your goodwill. And this is the notion of duty. So is there in fact a categorical comparative? Are there these moral duties, do they exist? Can we reason ourselves to them? Uh, and if uh, there are categorical comparatives, what do they tell us to do? What, what are the categorical comparatives, right? Like, are they the 10 commandments? Like, don't, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, right? Um, Kant proposes three main formulations of the categorical comparative that are supposed to all be equivalent, that give us uh, measures for what these rules of, of action, of duty are. Uh, the principle of the universal law, the principle of humanity, the principle of the kingdom of ends. Um, and we'll talk about the first two, the third one we won't get to. So the principle of the universal law just says, act only in accordance with that maxim that you can at the same time will as a universal law. It's a big mouthful, right? So um, the principle of universal law is just the, ethic, the ultimate ethical commandment. It's what we ultimately ought to do. It's what we reason to. And there's a way of thinking through how to produce one of these universal laws, one of these uh, objects of the categorical competitive rule for how to act, what our duty is. Um, it says only do those things that you could will that everyone else does too. If everybody could do it, then it's a good thing to do. And if everybody can't do it, then it's probably not a good thing to do. And there's no making exceptions for yourself. And this provides a test for any of our actions. So for instance, um, I'm late to work today. Uh, my neighbor's car is on and running because it's winter and mine is broken down. I could step into my neighbor's car that's on and running. It'll even be warm, right? Uh, and drive to work and get there on time. Or I take the bus and get there late. Uh, I think to myself, hmm, it'd be really good for me to be on time today. Uh, but I also think my neighbor probably also needs to get somewhere. That's why their car is on. Uh, what do I do? Well, um, I wonder what my duty is. Is this the sort of action, taking my neighbor's car, that everybody could perform? Could this rule of law, could this action, this, the maximum of this action, taking my neighbor's car, be willed universally? Could everybody in the world, when trying to get to work, say, I'm just going to take that car because it's running? No, yeah, no, right? Not everybody could steal cars every day, every time they wanted to drive, just like hop in whatever. It wouldn't work. The, the world would break down. So this is the application of the maxim of an action to universal rule. And in the case of everybody doing it, in the universal case, the world breaks down. It ceases to make sense. It just stops working. Things break. So this, Kant says, uh, indicates to us a part of what it is to, to have a duty. We have a duty not to steal people's cars. Um, we can even... Uh, uh, zoom out a little bit, stealing in general. What if everybody just stole everything all the time? That'd be an issue, right? We like, wouldn't have a concept of personal property. We might even lose the things that we really need, even if concept of personal property were not important. Um, so this universalization of uh, a kind of action like stealing shows that the world breaks down when we do it. Now, how about the alternative case, something good? Telling the truth. If I tell the truth, if everybody tells the truth all the time, does the world break down and become crazy and nonsense? No, it kind of still goes on as it does. So it must be our duty to tell the truth, says Kant, right? And this is reason operating on uh, normative, ethical, moral ideas uh, to produce in us this universal and absolute kind of conception of duty, what we ought to do. Good, okay, so uh, promise breaking, we'll talk about lying. 
So imagine that you need to borrow money from a friend and you know that you'll not be able to repay the debt. However, you also know that no one will lend you money unless you promise firmly to repay it within a determined time. Should you lie? You gotta pay rent. And you know your friend will front you the money if you say that you're gonna pay it back, but you know you won't be able to pay it back. You're already a month late. Do you lie? Is this, is this too revealing of personal character? Is this not a question that you'll answer? How about online? Is anybody brave enough to say that they'll lie to their friend? Is my video off this whole time? Oh my, <laughs> sorry. Hello. No, you all tell the truth. Yeah, Kant would say that you're good people. So the promise breakers maxim. When I believe myself to be in need of money, I shall borrow money and promise to repay it, even though I know this will never happen. The maxim is the principle upon which you intend to act, which is to ask for money without intending to repay it. And if everybody did it, if everybody always asked for money without ever intending to repay it, there would be no exchange of money ever. We would not trust one another, right? And so this must be a duty not to take money without intending to repay it. Kant says, no, this maxim doesn't universalize. It's a contradiction. You can't complete the thought experiment. That world doesn't make sense. The institution of promise breaking would be destroyed if it were known that people would break promises all the time. So Kant thinks that lying is universally wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It does not stand to the categorical imperative. And so it is always wrong to lie. Does this dress make me look fat? And you might say, why are you wearing a dress? And you might also say, yes. And my feelings would be hurt in either case, right? And so if you're lying to me, it might not hurt my feelings. The utilitarian would say, you know what? I'm gonna say, you look beautiful in that dress, right? And make the world a happier, better place because it hurts nobody. But it does help at least one person. Now for Kant, you get asked that question, you think, hmm, well, shoot. I can't universalize lying. Therefore, it must be my duty to tell the truth. Therefore, you look awful. And then you hurt the person. Like, that's that doesn't really seem to be a good consequence, right? But that doesn't matter. It's not the consequences of an action that make it good or bad for this deontological for Kant and his system of ethics. Um, rather, it is the maxim and its ability to stand to reason to our rational capacities that make actions good or bad. So let's make the case more dramatic. Now there's an ax murderer knocking at your door and they, they don't wanna kill you, don't, don't worry. They want to kill your roommate who's inside and you know this. And you know they knock on the door with the ax ching, 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 ching. and you open the door because you're an idiot. Don't open the door to people with axes. Um, I suppose, unless they're dressed like lumberjacks. Even then, probably, you know, yell through the door, who is it? Um, and they ask, hey, is your friend inside? I'd like to kill them. So what we learned from Kant is that it's our duty to tell the truth. So do we tell the truth? You tell the truth, yeah. You didn't even like your roommate anyways. <laughs> So if Kant is right, you are not morally permitted to lie to the axe murderer. And now with the final formulation of the, the categorical pair of the kingdom of ends one, we're all supposed to live in this utopia where everybody always acts with um, respect to the categorical imperative. And so there aren't axe murderers because you couldn't universalize axe murdering people. Um, but you know, in like an actual real world where there are axe murderers, um, Kant's still gonna say, eh, eh, lying's bad. You you've not acted in accordance with duty when you tell them to screw off, get out of here, axe murderer, my friend isn't home. So what should he do? Well, you should, according to Kant, tell the truth or subvert the truth, maybe not, even that. Um, but you at least shouldn't lie, but it seems to us that you should definitely, definitely lie, like, except in the case that your roommate has been eating all of your leftovers. And here's just like a historical reality check. So Kant, again, um, living in his ivory tower may not have thought of real world implications. 
So uh, these are two, uh, Harry Tillman, I'm sure you all are familiar with. Lewis Hayden, maybe less so, kind of an interesting abolitionist guy, escapes to um, Canada, uh, but ends up in Boston for a while as part of the Underground Railroad in 1850. The um, most hated law in the history of the United States is passed, which is uh, the law that allows recaptured slaves to be taken back to their plantations, no matter where in the country they're like even in free states, right? Um, and so it's like, you know, it gets passed in Congress, but nobody in the free states follows this law. So you get headhunters traveling around free states trying to take slaves back down south. Lewis Hayden um, is uh, one of these famous abolitionists who owns a house in Boston, and there's a couple of headhunters knocking on his door trying to collect a couple of slaves that he's protecting. And uh, he doesn't just lie. In fact, he, he tells the truth. He says, yeah, th these two people are inside, but you better not come in as well, because if you do, I'm going to blow this house to the holy hell and everything within 100 yards of it. I have four barrels of gunpowder, and I will kill everyone if you come any closer. And so they back off and they go away. Um, I'm not sure that blowing the house to holy hell um, satisfies the categorical comparative, but at least he told the truth, right? So anyways, it, you have these like slave headhunters knocking at your door. It's not just, you know, uh, lying to your friend about whether or not the dress makes them look good or not. Um, and you think to yourself, really, does a deontological Kantian system of ethics really give me the right moral evaluation of this case? Seems absurdly no. So um, similar to the act rule utilitarianism distinction, um, this is probably why Kant gave a few different formulations of the categorical imperative to account for strange cases like this. Um, so many scholars and probably Kant himself thought, well, the first formulation is not good enough uh, because it runs into these strange cases. We need, if we recall the three formulations, the second one as well, which is the principle of humanity. Um, so the principle of humanity says, act so that you use humanity, whether in your own person or in the persons of any others, not only merely as a means, but always at the same time as an end in itself. Did I get that right? I wasn't reading it as I was gone. Probably pretty close. Um, so the idea here is that you're not just universalizing maxims, but you're doing it with this kind of consideration for humanity. Uh, what counts? What we care about what matters to us, the, the, the dignity that's in all of us that we each have. Um, you have to not only universalize a maxim, but also do it in such a way that satisfies the, the respect for what it is to be a human, um, assuming that you think that there is such a thing worthy of respect in humans, which is a controversial, semi-controversial intuition. So part one says that you never treat humanity in your person or in the person of any other, anybody else, um, merely as a means. And two is you treat humanity as an end in itself. We should look at what both of these mean. So treating people as means just means treating someone in a way that's useful or convenient for you. But Kant isn't saying that we can't treat people as means. In fact, we need to all the time, right? You're treating me as a means right now. You all want to get good grades and you all want to pass your college courses and go on to live big old successful lives. And to do that, you have to have a good GPA. So you use me as a means to get the GPA and you turn in the assignments and stuff. And, um, and so th there's, there's a, an exchange going on. Um, but this isn't what's bad for Khan. It's, it's using one merely as a means. Um, so to use someone merely as a means is to use others um, uh, when we use others merely as a means is what we do reflects some maxim to which they could not in principle consent. So slavery, um, I'm using this person as a means to, uh, you know, farming my fields and I do not care about them or their dignity or their humanity at all, just so long as I get what I want, right? This is treating someone merely as a means. Um, in the case of lying to your friend about the money, this is treating your friend merely as a means. You're not respecting their dignity, what they care about, their humanity. You're only caring about what they can offer you. This is treating them merely as a means. It's not also at the same time respecting the humanity and dignity of that person as an end in itself, as something valuable and worthy and uh, necessary to take into consideration when uh, doing moral evaluation and trying to universalize maxims of actions. So, um, Good. 
how do we know that we treat someone merely as a means when we do this? Well, it's built into the example, right? That you're just taking their money and you don't care about them. You plan on not paying them back. This is directly treating them as not an end in themselves because as an end in themselves, they want their money back. So you got to respect that. So Kantian ethics is duty-based in part because it's articulated in the language of laws, commandments, duties, obligations, but there's more. There's moral people, according to Kant, um, that do the right thing because they recognize it's their duty to do so, and duty is the only appropriate moral motive. But what can unfailingly justify our finite moral and practical reasoning? What can um, make it so that we know categorically, universally, not just by uh, some uh, ad hoc principle of, well, it seems to me that, seems to you that, seems to pretty much everybody that, so it must be universal law. Um, but what would actually justify this in, this in the sort of way that maybe Descartes would have wanted as, as a form of justification for our moral, it, practical reasoning? Well, it would have to be some sort of divine, omniscient, omnipotent power, some non-finite thing that could think through it all. And so here we have Anscombe popping in again saying, well, without a robust foundation and perfect moral knowledge and power, a divinity or God or whatever, any conception of duty will remain finite and insubstantial. Might get pretty close, right? Seems pretty uh, well universalizable that we shouldn't lie or we shouldn't murder or we shouldn't um, you know, treat people differently on the basis of race or gender or skin color. Like we should treat people as ends in themselves so that we're respecting the dignity of their humanity, who and what they are, right? Um, th these seem like pretty well uh, universal principles, but uh, we are again, finite beings and there's no in principle way to um, make these evaluations of reason uh, foolproof. So back to the trolley problem. What would the Kantians say about this one? Would, the, would, would Kant push this guy? No? No? Probably. Probably. Okay, I want to hear from somebody who thought no. I want to hear from you. Uh, if we're talking about utility. No, Kantian. The Kantian. Would the Kantian do it? Um, I guess probably not. Well, I'm going to say four people. One, yeah, so um, uh, just put a pin in that because um, th th there's an interesting objection to deontological ethics in it. So, would one of you guys like to share? Just going off the fact that without the act of murder, there's no God, Good. So at face value, the, the comment here is that, well, of course, the Kantian says it, you can't universalize murder. And if you push the guy, you murder him. So no, the Kantian won't push him. Sorry, four people tied up on the tracks. It's a bummer, but lucky to be on the bridge that day behind in front of the Kantian. Better than the utilitarian. Um, better than the utilitarian who didn't just watch a comedic video. Um, but in your comment, there was the, there's an interesting objection to um, and trouble with Kantian ethics, which is how we persistify or choose what the maximum of the action that we're gonna try to hypothetically universalize is. So is the maximum of the action uh, kill one to save four, or is the maximum of the action push and kill? And so we have a different sort of scope, right? And in the larger scope, the push one to, to save four, you might get a Kantian that says, well, in every case, it is our duty to, to save more than less. And you, you could at least make an argument that would be compelling uh, for the universalization of a maxim like that. But say you restrict the scope of the maxim, we make it smaller and we say, uh, we're not taking into account the effect that like saving the four people is a part of like what goes in to the, the reasoning, whether or not this is good or bad. And we say, no, it just has to do with the push then you probably don't. You get the face value sort of Kantian evaluation. And this is this is a, a big question, an issue that Kantian scholars deal with quite a bit. What about what you had said about saying yes to the act of murder because it's universally wrong and bad. Can you also be universally murder to invite the act of murder in? Well, again, so it has to do with the scope of the maximum. So the, the hypothetical part of the, the imperative is to run these simulations. 
And the way that you do it is you choose the maximum of an action. So like what it is that the action consists in. So uh, murdering somebody or pushing someone on the tracks to save four people. These would both count as maxims of an action. And, and then you use your reason to universalize it. You say, could this be done by everybody? Would it still work? Um, and if you have the wider scoped maxim, it seems to. And if you have the smaller scope maxim, it ceases to seem to. And there's nothing clearly in Kant that gives us uh, a, a reason to um, determine what the scope of a maxim should be in one case or over another. So again, it's up to like the Kant scholars to, to argue and quibble amongst themselves how we should conceive of these things. Um, so yeah, it, it's a genuine textual puzzle and problem. I understand Kant for um, the maximum, I guess. So lying in the maximum of the axe murder and make the maximum bigger of this person murdering. So lying would then outweigh the maximum of the murderer. Yeah, and you can also shift context in, in maxims too. So your maxim can be, you know, the greater, or smaller in scale, but um, you can also uh, have like, so, uh, drunk drivers flying down the road and imagine like Batman can, if he like steals somebody's car, can like get in front and stop the drunk driver from causing any harm. So the maximum of the action might be stopping the drunk driver from causing harm. This is a universally good thing, but the way in which it needs to be done is to steal the car, right? So you can change the context of the maxim as well to create strange edge cases that create problems for, for this like, our duty is whatever we can rationally come up with. And as soon as you, um, you know, uh, shake reason up a little bit, uh, it, it gives you a different, um, different principles of duty, which can be trouble for, for the issue. So again, it's a good day to be uh, in front of a Kantian on a bridge, bad day to be in front of a utilitarian. Um, has your answer changed? Has anybody's answer changed? As you uh, just like what's the fat guy do? What what is the case of society versus what does poor people do? So the, people or the we want more context. Yeah. So now th th this is I think a good consideration. Um, we're we're recognizing the limits of our moral reasoning. Um, and what we want is more information so that we can make evaluations, not just based on numbers or based on rational principles of duty, because these seem to get us nowhere, or at least get us into strange situations. What we want is exactly what you asked for. We want um, considerations about humanity, like what are these, who are these people? And uh, what do they offer to me, to the world, to everybody? Um, what really makes the world flourish or a better place? And this is very much Anscombe's purpose in calling modern moral philosophy stupid up to this point in 1950. She says, let's stop worrying about this like moral ought and start worrying about what makes us well or live well, be well, right? Who cares if something is moral? Uh, we learn so much more from emotive language. Uh, so her example is like, this is bad versus this is cowardly. It's more descriptive. It gives us a, a real grip. It, it, that kind of language adds texture to our evaluations and our evaluative claims about what the circumstance in the world is. To say something is bad, say like, it's bad to push the man over the bridge. Well, okay, but why? Or you could say, uh, it's cowardly not to pull the lever. That means something a little different, right? Um, it, you, you get into this like moral ought language and things become so theoretical, but you, accuse or um, uh, describe emotively. And, and we start to get um, this information that we were looking for. Like what are people looking for in these cases to help them make the evaluations is um, what we give and how we live and um, uh, how these features of our humanity um, operate. And this is what matters in moral evaluation, not some other theoretical in principle, rational or mathematical uh, equation-based hypothetical thinking. We live a mode of lives whose moral worth is better measured by what it is to live well 
than any theory-laden concept of what one ought to do. And so what we need, or what we really are looking for in an ethics, in a moral system, is an ethics of living well, of what it is to flourish. Um, and where can we find one? Well, it's always been there. It's Aristotle. We just sort of forgot for a few hundred years, maybe even a thousand. Um, and this will be what we cover next week. So uh, next week, we'll be talking about virtue ethics as an alternative to these other forms of uh, moral reasoning. Uh, the principal idea of virtue ethics is that uh, goodness isn't about intention or consequence. It's rather about states of character, what it is to be that kind of person, and that the good person is the one who uh, has these character traits. And so we're not so much evaluating actions as the dispositions of, of personhood that produce actions. And that's what we're morally evaluating. Um, and it avoids all of these strange edge case issues. It has its own problems and challenges to overcome, but um, at least in the argument, the modus ponens version of the argument from Anscombe is the, the superior uh, way to go. And this paper that we read for class today uh, absolutely like revitalizes and inspires the, the virtue ethical system as um, the preeminent one, really. Um, you don't really get straight up utilitarians anymore, like strange people in strange departments here and there. And they're creepy cobwebby corners and same with the ontologist, but really virtue ethics is like overtaken everything and not just in ethics, but it's also been applied to epistemology and um, uh, bioethics and, and, and all over the place. So um, we'll look at uh, Aristotle, Nicomachean ethics next week. Um, here's one to leave you. So um, go be good people, holy or don't. So this guy has a beard now. It says, 40 years later, you return to this spot. You're much older and have made many decisions in your lifetime, but this is the one that haunts you. It was an impossible situation, an unwinnable conundrum. Even though you tell yourself you made the right choice, you continue to wrestle with the decision. Perhaps in another life, you would feel differently, but this is not another life. This is reality. The reality of the conclusion that you chose. Is it possible to move on? Yeah, shave your beard, dude. <laughs> right? All right. See you next week. Thank you.